as Calista said, my name's Emma Harbison um, and I'm the manager for National Rural Issues. Um, so my role focuses uh, majority, uh, majority on um, supporting the adoption of sustainable agricultural practices um, while preparing our rural industries for um, a future that's resilient towards climate change. Um, so I might start sharing my screen. Um, so maybe just give me a thumbs up once everyone can see my screen. Great. Um, so yes, as mentioned today, I will be presenting on our uh, or on some insights from our Banking on Sustainability project, um, which was completed by KPMG in 2023. Um, so. Today I'll briefly go through the project purpose, a um, bit of an overview on the ESG landscape, um, an overview on sustainable financing, the future of financing across rural industries, um, as well as some insights on uh, how to prepare um, for the future, um, all from the Banking on Sustainability project. So I'll touch briefly as well on a project that we have recently commenced, which is a bit of a subsequent project to this one um, around environmental and social lending um, and show you where to access some further information through our AgriFutures Knowledge Hub. Um, hopefully we'll have some time at the end for questions as well, um, but if not, my contact details will be on the slide. Um, so if there's any questions, feel free to reach out to me after the presentation. So we will jump straight into it. Um, so the project purpose for this project, so um, we acknowledge that the landscape for sustainable financing is and was rapidly evolving. Um, and this report really summarises the state of the market at point in time. So I really just wanted to preface um, this presentation by saying that any findings or insights that I'm sharing today should be considered in that context and that there could have been um, changes in the market um, and in the landscape since um, this report was published. Um, but really the focus was to explore environmental and social lending in the context of Australian primary production, um, focusing on market dynamics, driving um, an increased focus on sustainability across the Australian financial sector, um, really to understand how changes in lending uh, and insuring products and practices will impact primary producers at the end of the day. So um, a key part of the project was to understand not only the opportunities, but also the requirements and considerations for primary producers um, to access sustainable financing products. Um, as listed on the screen there, um, we had some or three key objectives, um, which included understanding why financial institutes adopt sustainable financing, um, and its relevance to agriculture, how sustainable financing mechanisms are structured um, and what the relevant requirements are that producers are required to meet. Um, and then the final objective was what information tools or technologies are available to producers to report on and access sustainable products. So um, what is the ESG landscape? Um, so ESG stands for Environmental, Social and Governance. Um, and it's now actually quite a critical part of modern business practices. Um, so we see it becoming more and more a standard part of everyday business activities. Um, it can be quite complex um, and it can be look, used to look at um, businesses from a risk or a performance point of view um, to sort of assess how the business operations impact the environment, um, the society, the society um, and then also how it's governed as well. So um, ESG risks can lead to a number of different outcomes. Um, such as a natural disaster um, could affect a company's work or um, their activities could um, be affecting the local community. Um, and, you know, these risks can show up in, you know, a number of different ways as well. They can either be quite direct, like flood damage to a building, um, or they could be quite indirect, um, like issues in production that um, could affect a company's earnings. Um, so this is just a really good visual representation <laughs> from the KPMG um, report on the physical and transition risks um, as well as their associated financial effects. So financial institutions now are uh, recognising ESG risks as equally important as traditional risks like credit um, or operational risks. Um, and this is due to the significant effect that um, ESG can have on their financial returns. Um, so for example, banks and insurers that aren't managing climate related risks could see a decrease in profits. Um, and so therefore they may need to hold more capital as a result of that. So they are quite exposed obviously to these risks through, throughout their investment um, and lending activities. Um, and so the environmental and climate risks 
um, are, are really important to them and proving more and more important. Um, we can divide those risks into two different sections or criteria. So we've got physical risks and transition risks. Um, and within, um, within this includes reputational risk. So reputational risk um, is something that's proving to be more and more important um, and prominent, should I say. Um, and it's arising when, you know, there's a negative perception due to a company's failure to address these ESG risks in their operations um, and up and down the value chain. So the ESG landscape, um, it's not only, ESG is not only a way um, for companies to measure impact on and how, they're, how well they're doing or how well their business is managed, um, but it's also a tool for investors to choose where to invest their money. Um, and banks are making their own lending decisions based on ESG criteria. Um, so ultimately for producers, this means that how you run your farm and look after the land and your community can influence the financial support that you get from banks and investors, um, which is going to be a challenge, right? Um, but the bigger challenge is that there's not really one way to measure ESG yet. Um, and this is something that, um, you know, we're facing ongoing um, challenges around within the sector and have been over the last couple of years as well. Um, there are frameworks, however, like the dairy sustainability framework um, for dairy, for beef, there's the Australian beef sustainability framework that work at an industry level. And then there's the Australian agricultural sustainability framework, which works at a national level um, to help farmers to sort of see and report on good practices while staying competitive in the market as well. Um, and so on that, I thought I would um, show this slide and this may be really familiar to a number of you. This may all be, also be the first time that you've seen it. Um, a lot of people have a bit of PTSD sometimes looking at this, um, this graphic, um, but this is the Australian Agricultural Sustainability Framework, um, which is a joint initiative um, led by the National Farmers Federation um, and supported by the Australian government. Um, and it out, sets out a unified understanding of the sustainability objectives through um, a set of themes, principles, and then um, a set of criteria that underpin those principles as well. Um, and you can see there's three areas that that covers, so environmental stewardship, um, how well we look after the well-being of people, animals in the community, um, and then also economic resilience. Um, and the aim, the overarching aim of this framework is to align sector specific and supply chain terminology um, to foster coherence um, and enable better communication of industry wide sustainability goals um, within Australia, but also in the global context. Um, so when this report was finalised, there was a number um, of drivers. So there was four key drivers which underpinned ESG at that point in time. Um, and these are listed. They're not listed in any um, particular order, um, but just going through them. So megatrends was one of the key um, drivers. So um, with ESG getting more and more attention um, because of the global changes, um, such as an increased population, um, urbanisation, ageing demographics, we've got environmental changes as well, um, technolo technological advancements um, and loss of wildlife, for example. Um, the World Economic, Economic Forum um, reported that business leaders around the world are seeing these ESG issues as some of the biggest risks out there. Um, and this means for producers that understanding ESG is becoming crucial to keep up with these global shifts, but also to make sure that farming practices are sustainable for the future. Um, so the second point, consumer demands. Um, so we found throughout the report that when consumers decide what to buy, they're looking more at what a company stands for and its reputation and whether it's doing the right thing. Um, additional research had showed that most people like to buy from brands that share their values. Um, and many say that a company's environmental and social efforts have actually made them change what they buy. So consumers are checking out how companies are affecting the environment and whether they're sourcing things ethically and treating their work as well um, and also using their resources wisely. So as you know, a result of this, businesses are really sort of being for, forced to focus on ESG as a part of their daily operations and business planning to sort of meet that consumer demand. Uh, the third one, so investor demand. So investments in ESG have, have grown quite quickly 
Um, and in the report, it identified that um, they, were, they were expecting that by 2024, half of all of the money managed by professionals would be in ESG assets. Um, and this was bec because more investors wanted to make um, they wanted to make more money while doing good for the society and for the environment. Um, and so um, at the time of the report, the sustainable investments were growing way faster than traditional ones. Um, and there was about four trillion US dollars. Um, that took a lot to get my head around. Four trillion US dollars um, were already put into ESG categories. Um, and a report that was done in 2021 actually found that 70% of a selection of ESG assets outperformed their non-ESG counterparts, which it's crazy to me how to think those numbers would have changed in the last three years as well. Um, so I'd be really interested to see where those numbers are today. Um, and then the fourth, um, fourth mega trend here, um, or the fourth driver, sorry, not mega trend, was the reporting trend. So the world of sustainability um, reporting is changing because investors are wanting to know more and more about the ESG efforts of the companies that they put their money into. Um, and there's a big push for these companies to share more detailed reports on their environmental and social actions. Um, in 2022, just before this report was published, almost every big company around the world was talking about their sustainability efforts, which is, you know, a significant advancement in comparison to what, you know, everyone was talking about 20 years ago. Um, and there is also now rules, new rules that businesses have to follow, um, telling them what they do need to report on about ESG. Um, the number of these rules has nearly doubled in the last five years, purely because investors and governments and people want to know this information about businesses. Um, but it's not easy um, to be able to provide this information because there are so many different ways to report on ESG um, and they're not all the same. So I just wanted to highlight that there is work that is being done um, on trying to make these reporting methods more alike so that it is easier for businesses to report um, and for everyone to understand what they're doing for sustainability. Um, but like I said, it's not an easy process. Um, so I wanted to share this table as a bit of a visual to demonstrate some of the climate change commitments that have been made by global and local financial institutions um, against global frameworks. So acknowledging, however, again, this was at a point in time when the report was finalised, so there could be a number of players that have entered this space. Um, some of these um, frameworks could have changed slightly. Um, so, yes, just prefacing that. But you can see here that there are or there were a number of banks that were aiming for net zero emissions and, and um, most of them are all still quite current. Um, a number of the big four banks are also part of the UN's net zero banking alliance, so they're aligning their lending with environmental goals. Um, major super funds like Australian Super have set targets to decarbonise and disclose their um, performance. And then also we've got um, big insurers like Allianz and QBE who have committed to net zero emissions as well um, across their insurance and investment activities by 2050. Um, so there are some really big commitments out there um, to be aware of as well. So um, with all of that in mind, how does this ultimately relate to rural industries? So the Australian government set a goal to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions by 43% by 2030. Um, and industries are now setting their own targets to match this. Um, for example, the National Farmers Federation supported or uh, well, supports a net zero emissions goal by 2050, um, so long as there are realistic ways for rural industries to reduce their emissions um, and so long as we have supportive policies to enable that. Um, the red, red meat industry, for example, wants to be carbon neutral by 2030 and the dairy industry aims to cut their emissions intensity by 30% as well. So the success of these goals really depend on producers being able to cut down track and report on their emissions. Um, but there's also trade rules that are changing internationally with many of our leading trade partners um, setting their own net zero targets, leading to new rules um, for market access based on environmental sustainability. So there's carbon border tariffs um, like the EU's carbon border adjustment mechanism, um, which are becoming an important part of global trade um, and with the objective to try and avoid carbon leakage, which um, is defined as where um, efforts made in one country to cut emissions uh, lead to an increase in emissions in another country. 
Um, so, you know, additionally, international companies are, like banks um, are also influenced by these sustainability regulations, um, which could impact Australian operations as well um, when we consider the disclosure of scope three um, emissions and setting reduction targets. So speaking of scope one, two and three, I thought um, it would be useful to show this graphic um, because I think there's still a limited understanding of what scope one, two and three emissions are um, and what they practically mean. So as you can see here, scope one emissions are those direct emissions that are produced from the business operations. Um, so I would think livestock, machinery, um, those sorts of things. Scope two emissions are the indirect emissions that are produced to generate power by business. Um, so example, electricity. Um, and then scope three emissions are indirect emissions also that are created by um, businesses and suppliers and, cons and customers, sorry, um, such as transport and logistics companies, food manufacturing, um, and then the food waste. So they all sort of fall into that scope three um, indirect uh, emissions category. So sustainable financing, um, what is it? I really like the Australian Sustainable Finance Institute's definition which defines it as sustainable finance is the transition of global financial system towards more effective products and services that meet the long-term needs of, of a sustainable economy. Um, but for farmers and rural businesses, um, you know, getting loans and insurance is part of everyday life. Um, a lot of farms are family run um, and therefore access to capital um, is, you know, vital to be able to grow and manage risk within their business. Um, so when banks are looking at whether they should um, or would lend to a, a business, they look at mainly two types of information. The first type of information is financial, which looks at how much the money, how much money the business is making um, and how much debt there is. Um, but the second type of information is non-financial information, which is checking out how good the business owner is at running the business, um, dealing with problems like bad crops um, or changes in market prices. Excuse me. And banks are using both of this, both of these types of information to figure out if the business is a good risk or what interest rate um, they would apply to the loan. Um, similarly, insurance products are a safety net for farmers, um, allowing them to sort of hand over a bit of that risk um, if something did go wrong to an insurance company um, in exchange for a fee, um, which is the premium that they pay. Um, and Australian farmers have access to a number of different insurance products to protect them against, um, you know, frost and hail and wind and fire and livestock theft and those sorts of things. There are brokers out there and financial advisors that can help farmers figure out what risk they need to cover um, in their insurance policy. Um, and depending on, you know, what they farm, like what crops or livestock, um, the insurance company will then um, figure out the risk and how much it will cost, which is um, a process called underwriting. Um, and this process basically puts a price on the risk, um, predicting how much the farmer might claim during the policy um, based on past claims data, um, also to work out the chance of whether something could go wrong um, during, the time of, during the time of the insurance um, period. So in a nutshell, sustainable financing for rural industries involves integrating ESG criteria into a financial institution's approach to asset allocation, lending and underwriting. Um, and basically, it just means that they're incorporating ESG into where they invest their money. Um, and the landscape of sustainable financing for producers is still very much emerging. Um, and it's, you know, in the last couple of years, we've seen it emerge more, but it's still very much in that early stage. Um, and as such, there are only a few sort of global examples um, to be able to utilise as part of this project um, to sort of showcase the sustainable financing products that were used. Um, but for this project, they did focus on five emerging sustainable financing approaches in Australia. Um, and these are demonstrated on this screen. So we've got um, down the, the left-hand side, um, we've got the lending products, and then down the right hand side, we've got the insurance products. So you may be aware of some of these um, or have seen them. They may have also slightly changed or been replaced um, since the report was published. Um, but if I look at one of these in particular, um, we can talk through the um, CBA, Sustainability Linked Loan with Stockyard Group. So 
in 2021, um, CBA agreed upon a loan with Stockyard Group, who's a large beef cattle producer in Queensland. Um, and the loan's interest rate was linked to how well Stockyard Group did in reducing emissions um, and taking care of animal welfare and looking after their employees' wellbeing. So if they hit the ESG goals that they'd agreed upon with the bank, they would get a lower interest rate um, as a reward. But if they didn't meet those targets, the interest rate went up as um, a bit of a uh, bit of a penalty. Um, so they have to report back to the bank every year um, on five specific things that they agree on. Um, and those targets are set each year by um, themselves in the bank. Um, and then an independent company actually checks to make sure everything's on track. Um, and the loan's cost um, is ultimately tied to how well they're doing in those areas around emissions reduction and um, animal welfare and, and staff treatment. So if they do well, they get paid more. If they don't, there's a penalty. Um, it's a bit of a way for the bank to encourage businesses to be more sustainable. Um, so I thought in comparison to that, I would throw in an example from um, New Zealand, um, which is something else that we briefly touched on as part of the report as a comparison. So the Bank of New Zealand launched a loan in 2022 um, that rewards farmers for meeting sustainability criteria, similar to the CBA one. Um, to get this loan, however, producers had to undergo a farm assessment by an expert to see how green their farming practices were. Um, and then they would set goals with the Bank of New Zealand. Um, and if they met them, they would get the cheaper loan rate. And if they didn't, similar to CBA, um, their loan rate could have um, increased costs. So the idea similar um, would be for the producer to pick three ways to make their farm better or improve the, um, the impact on the environment. But with the New Zealand one, they had to include ways to reduce the farm's impact specifically on climate. So New Zealand were focusing on farming in a way that's good for the land and the community as well. Um, so that's just two examples um, that were highlighted throughout the report. Um, there are a couple of other case studies as well throughout the report, um, which I can show you where to access at the end of um, the presentation. But um, the future, I wanted to touch on the future of financing across rural industries as it was covered in the report. Um, so as I've mentioned, we know that sustainable financing is changing um, and it changes, it has changed quite rapidly. Um, but the two main pathways forward um, from this report was either to um, add new loan products um, that reward green, green practices um, or by banks actually making ESG factors part of their everyday business decisions. Um, ultimately, the integration of ESG related data um, as an input into the risk process um, would influence the price pricing of loans and insurance policies. Um, but, you know, that's the view from the report as the mainstreaming of sustainable finance, where those ESG metrics are inherently considered um, core to all investing, lending um, and insuring uh, processes um, going forward. So that was the state of play with the report. Um, and we do have a secondary project that's underway that I'll talk to a little bit more around um, an update to that information. Um, but I've spoken a little bit about the state of play and what the projections were for sustainable financing, but with everything, there are, you know, barriers and challenges. Um, and so there were specific barriers to the expansion of sustainable finance that were identified through the project. Um, and so a number of those challenges exist. So I've listed them again, they're not listed in any particular order um, from a um, materiality or point of view. Um, but the first one being a lack of fit for purpose on farm data. So when we think about that, we're thinking about the data consistency, the data availability, and then ultimately the data the data accessibility. Um, number two is the lack of consistency across the agricultural sustainability framework. So I touched on this briefly, um, but there is uh, there is a lack of alignment and consistency across industry specific sustainability frameworks um, in terms of the metrics and the targets um, and goals that can create really adverse and inefficient outcomes across the sector. So for example, metrics relating to soil health may vary across frameworks um, as they describe best management practices to improve soil health in a specific commodity um, or with regards to a, um, a geography specific um, context. So 
To help mitigate this, the Australian Agricultural Sustainability Framework seeks to provide a bit of a translation mechanism between industry sustainability frameworks and how the information from these frameworks is used at a global level. Um, so number three is the administrative burden for producers. And this is something that I'm quite passionate about um, because we don't want to reinvent the wheel or make things more challenging on farm. Um, there's a lot of challenges that producers face um, that are sort of becoming more inherently um, present than others. Um, but yeah, trying to reduce that administrative burden is huge. And so we know that in order to access these financial products or sustainable financial products, producers have you know, been ad advised or are known that they, it is known that they are required to measure and report on data points to demonstrate their on-farm performance and compliance across a variety um, of best practice or certification programs. Um, and this data sometimes is recorded and uploaded to multiple platforms. Um, it might be provided to various stakeholders depending on what, you know, they need, depending on the markets that they access um, as well. So, providing that to a bank in addition um, can result in a process that is, you know, administrative burden for them, which may actually outweigh the benefit of participating in the financing product or in accessing financing products as well. So um, that was a, a really key barrier that came through. Um, skill and capacity gaps. So um, it was identified that there is actually a need for education and capability building to help both financial institutions as well as primary producers prepare and respond to the demands for sustainable finance and um, in accelerating ESG more broadly. Um, specifically for producers, though, there's still limited understanding across the sector of the economics of sustainable financing um, around the incentives and the costs and benefits of entering into these types of agreements. Um, and so the suggestion from the report is that, you know, producers prepare themselves for the emerging reporting requirements that banks are looking for and potentially going to need in the future if they wish to secure um, sustainable financing products. Um, number five, or finally, there's a lack of understanding, um, again, around the costs and benefits of participation. So there, when this report was published, there was not a clear indication of the costs and benefits of participating in sustainable financing products. Um, and existing uh, financial arrangements do require the auditing, assurance, verification um, of, a, of a producer's performance um, against those predetermined metrics, um, which is quite resource and cost intensive. Um, and sometimes producers are actually the ones which are required to cover that cost, which ultimately, you know, it's not clear whether the costs of participating um, in financial arrangements will outweigh the benefits provided by cheaper costs of capital. Um, and, you know, that absence of clear costs and benefits is um, or was identified as a huge barrier um, to the expansion of sustainable finance in Australia. So preparing for the future. Um, so the findings from this report really suggested that ESG is here to stay. Um, and it's a statement that we know is true um, in its evolution over the last couple of years. Um, we have seen the ESG landscape um, evolve quite quickly um, and the ESL, so the environmental and social lending landscape as well, um, has evolved um, alongside it. And, you know, financial institutions have acknowledged that their lending portfolios are exposed to or are now exposed to environmental and social risks um, that could materially impact their financial performance. Um, and, you know, more broadly, they are beginning to integrate these risks into their everyday decision making, um, which does have the potential to reshape lending and insurance into the future um, if it's applied across the board um, and not just specifically to the sort of um, sustainable financing products. Um, but, you know, with this um, in mind, it could also lead to increased requirements for producers to measure and report their environmental and social risks um, and performance as a financing requirement. Um, so something to be conscious there. But, um, you know, as these sustainable finance arrangements um, continue to evolve and mature, um, the recommendation out of the report was that producers should be producers should be considering new practices or processes um, and processes that you know could help them measure and report on their sustainability performance um, in in order to be able to then demonstrate that to buyers and financiers. Um, so while 
obviously acknowledging that it's not mandated yet, um, but there are clear signals um, in the market that it's quickly evolving um, to a point where sustainability is becoming a sort of an expectation rather than um, rather than an option. Um, so the report sort of recommends that there are several actions that producers can actually take um, or could take um, to set themselves up for success um, in this changing environment. Um, and, you know, while the incentives such as sustainably linked loans and price premiums are still emerging and um, people are still outweighing the costs and benefits of whether it's worth engaging in them, um, there are some um, primary benefits that come from sustainable farm um, management practices. And, and I've got those listed there around, you know, that increased productivity, um, resilience, climate resilience, increased climate resilience, um, reduced inputs, um, ability to access markets and continue to access markets into the future. Um, um, it might mean that, you know, if you're not reporting on ESG, you therefore are restricted as to what um, markets you can access. Um, and then also um, an increase around your company or products reputation um, from being able to demonstrate and report on that, um, those ESG criteria. Um, so setting yourself up for success. So following on from that, um, it's still sustainability, uh, sustainable financing is, as I mentioned, still in early stages, um, but we have seen it get quite a lot of traction lately. Um, and we're seeing producers become more informed about sustainability and are starting to ask their banks um, on guidance on what they should be doing and how they should be doing it. Um, so the report outlines a number of steps that producers can take now to prepare themselves for um you know, to be eligible for those sustainable um, financing products. Um, and these include really being clear on the value proposition and the reasons why you're adopting a sustainable practice. So creating a business plan is key. Um, prioritising those sustainable farming um, practices will really help producers to be able to better make decisions and improve the business in the long run. Um, and explaining why those practices are important will make um, you know, the business product message clearer as well to customers um, and could lead to a better market opportunity. Um, so, you know, the clear value proposition is um, really important. Understanding your bench, uh, your baseline and identifying the activities that you need to stop, start and improve is key. So a baseline can really help producers with a reference as a reference point um, to understand their environmental and social impacts um, and help them identify the areas that they can focus on for improvement. Um, but it'll also, the understanding of an on-farm performance can help support these businesses to measure their progress against certain sustainability goals as well um, and targets. The third dot point, so aligning an industry sustainability framework or aligning to an industry sustainability framework, sorry. Um, you know, it's encouraged by a lot of industry that have um, sustainability frameworks that producers are encouraged to get involved um, with those sustainability guidelines specific to their industry. Um, these can, you know, outline the most important sustainability issues for that industry and how they can apply um, them in their farm management. But it's also really important to consider the unique aspects of certain locations when applying these guidelines to their farming practices. And, you know, I mentioned earlier the inconsistency across the frameworks. Um, and, you know, in particular, if you're a mixed enterprise where you don't align with specifically one over the other, there can be certain crossovers in, in the farming practices that you're applying. So it's just, you know, a call out to be um, considerate of those um you know, different industries, um, as well as the different geographic locations of where they're applying um, or where they're suggesting to apply those guidelines. Um, fourth one, so setting targets, success measures and KPIs um, to determine how, how often performance will be measured. So um, KPIs can really help producers to review their past actions and plan for a better um, future. Um, and by measuring um, and verifying farm outcomes, they can actually see or track progress towards their sustainability goals, um, whilst also spotting any issues um, with their new practices early on. Um, establishing a farm management plan that's aligned to these targets and KPIs. So um, the report suggests that producers should consider um, and create or consider creating a farm management plan to identify and handle sustainability um, issues for their farm. Um, and, you know, this plan would outline environmental and social efforts um, to improve sustainability um, and explain how the businesses will tackle all ESG um, concerns whilst meeting the expectations of important stakeholders like 
their buyers and consumers and financiers. Um, establishing a plan for reporting. So similarly, once they've um, established their plan, they need to be able to establish another plan for reporting on these KPIs and the performance. Um, so it's really important to know how to measure and access um, and assess also the report, um, the sort of reporting of their KPIs and their performance to be able to then demonstrate and communicate that back to their consumers and lenders. Um, and then finally, uh, assessing the costs and benefits of entering into a sustainable financing solution. So it's really encouraged that producers weigh up the pros and cons of sustainable financing pro programs and products um, to consider both the administrative and financial costs to start up the reporting requirements um, and set anything up um, to measure that against the benefits um, of the reduced premium of cost of capital as well. Um, and they should also consider um, the on-farm advantages of adopting best practices um, and better resilience and product, uh, productivity as well um, to make sure that it aligns with their, um, their business goals. So there's a number of tools and resources that do exist um, and that can support producers to prepare um, and validate their sustainability credentials. Um, it is always best to refer to your industry representative body just to identify any industry specific tools that are available to you. Um, but I thought I would just highlight a few from the report. Um, so there also may be other ones that, um, as I mentioned, have come out since now, but these are some of the ones that are covered in the report. So specifically for the red meat industry, um, I've listed three that cover climate related reporting. So specifically Climate Kelpie, um, it helps to connect producers with climate information to help make better farm business decisions for their climate with regards to the climate. Um, Climate is a tool um, that assists users to identify a range um, of possible forage scenarios and planning for their livestock numbers and their panic management um, options. And then Healthy Soils Hub, um, it's a tool that provides users with practical resources for soil testing and management um, ahead of sowing as well. Um, and then also some industry agnostic tools that exist. Um, so there's carbon accounting resources. So there's a number of different emissions um, calculators that exist. Um, we've got the Cool Farm one, um, there's the Farm GAS tool um, and the Greenhouse Accounting Framework tools as well, the GAF tools. Um, but another one that wasn't covered in the report that I really just wanted to touch on was the recently released one from Agricultural Innovation Australia. They've just recently um, released their environmental accounting platform. Um, another one there, you've got Farm Print. So it's one that uh, allows producers to access um, or assess, should I say, their environmental performance uh, across their own operations, but as well as um, inputs into their farming system. So looking at fertilizers, chemicals and diesel, for example, um, it also has the ability to facilitate an assessment of a producer's performance against a regional benchmark, um, which is really handy. And then the final one, um, just to touch on, was ag, the ag care tool. Um, and this resource involves um, producers, you know, involves it's a producer assessment um, and an audit across several modules, including an ecological values model, um, a commodity specific assessment, carbon footprint, uh, as well as the verification of various sustainability management practices. Um, so that's just a couple of the ones highlighted, but there is a full list of tools and resources available um, within the report itself. Um, so that's sort of um, an overview of the Banking on Sustainability project from KPMG. Um, but I wanted to touch briefly on um, a project that we've recently co recently commenced um, as a bit of a subsequent project. Um, so this project, um, we had engaged UTS um, in Sydney, the University of Technology, um, and they're going to deliver it through two phases. So the first phase is really building upon um, the work that was done by KPMG um, with the objective to provide that updated landscape on how environmental and social lending has evolved um, and any considerations for Australian primary producers. Um, so phase one covers three aspects. So the current landscape and criteria that exists, um, any future trends and banking support that needs to be considered, and then an update of technological solutions um, and social impacts. So it will also assess sort of existing loan products um, and anticipate the future trends um, involving the sort of financial support implications for farmers um, and, yeah, evaluating any barriers to entry for participation in those financial schemes. Um, and then the second phase will be 
So really to allow producers to make more informed decisions about their financing arrangements, um, we identify that there's a need to further research the costs and benefits associated with sustainable farming, uh, farming practices um, and the economic value um, associated across agriculture, fish and forestry. So touching on that sort of um, highlighted gap that we saw from the KPMG report around, you know, a lack of clarity of the costs and benefits. So phase two will focus on conducting thorough research in analysing the costs and benefits um, and the true costs associated with capturing and reporting on sustainability. Um, it'll also utilise the triple bottom line principle. So looking at people, planet and profit um, to assess um, and present the economic benefits and recommendations regarding barriers to entry. Um, throughout the phase, we're hoping to develop a framework to enable producers to make informed decisions about their financing arrangements um, based on the costs and benefits, um, cost benefits and economic values. Um, and then throughout the whole project, we will be developing some grassroots level adoption materials um, to be able to extend this information out um, more broadly. So looking at case studies, potentially looking at um, videos, mini podcast series, really to showcase the practical examples of where producers are accessing sustainable financing products um, to encourage that broader application um, or broader adoption, um, but also to talk to financiers and understand that sort of stuff um, with producers as well. So, um, yes, hoping to really get into the nuts and bolts of it there. Um, the project is scheduled to complete in October this year, um, and then we're hoping to have extension materials um, and the report published before Christmas, um, given that we're already <laughs> halfway through July. Um, that seems to be coming around very quickly. Um, but yes, that is a project that we are in the middle of um, and hoping to have some further resources come out in the next five months, which is very exciting. Um, so now, where to access further information? So um, you can find, you know, all of our reports and resources on the AgriFutures Australia website. Um, we have what's called our, our Knowledge Hub. Now I'm going to click on this link and hope that everyone can see. Can everyone just put a thumbs up if they can see the Knowledge Hub? Um, yep, great. Thanks, Daniel. Um, so this hub houses all of our research um, publications. Oh, I don't know if you can... Hmm. Maybe you can't see that anymore. Let's go to there. Um, so, oh, can you still see that screen? Yeah. Okay. Um, so it houses all of our, um, yes, knowledge, um, all of our resource, resources and publications, fact sheets, podcasts um, and everything. So um, this is the AgriFutures main homepage. But if you click on the Knowledge Hub, um, you can see here that it highlights sort of the latest project and the latest resources for um, ease of locating, um, depending on what's recently been um, released. But you can also use these filters here um, to be able to um, narrow down and find what you're looking for. So, for example, if you were looking for the Banking on Sustainability report, um, you could simply type in um, banking. Oops, if I spelt it right, um, that would help. Um, and you can see that the Banking on Sustainability report comes up straight away. Um, alternatively, if you are looking for industry-specific resources, you can, you know, click on um, the broader programmatic um, industry applications or you can see, oh, I'm looking for Buffalo and you can actually apply to Buffalo and it will bring up the Buffalo-related um, uh, resources. Um, if you're a popular topic kind of a person and looking for something specific to sustainability, um, you can click on that as a, as a theme um, or a topic and it will bring up all of the resources across all of the industries um, relevant to sustainability. Um, and also if you're someone who only prefers um, short, sharp snippets, so maybe industry summaries, for example, or fact sheets, um, you can select that and it'll bring up obviously all the, um, you know, six page or short um, topic um, or short resources, should I say. So um, that's how to access um, our re reports and um, and recommend uh, reports and resources. Um, if there's projects that are um, underway, they do. We do have project pages on our website, which give you um, a snapshot of the project overview, um, and then also a contact person um, if you'd like to sort of keep um, across that project. But um, also, we have our newsletters, um, which go out with new resources, um, and our social media as well, um, where we do share. Um, yeah, share links to new reports um, and also social media um, videos or, or any case studies that we have developed as well. So, 